father perhaps learnt more from him than anybody. And my father was a beekeeper in, uh, well, all his life really. And his, his father before him. But uh, he got a job uh, teaching beekeeping uh, in the borders. And Willie Smith lived in the borders. So my father learnt from the people that he was teaching because there was an awful lot of skills in those days that, that had to be looked at and see how people were going on in the 50s, the 1950s. And Willie Smith was one of them, you know. So that was a huge boost in education for my father. And of course, my father could tell all the, he had 150 beekeepers to teach. And, uh, and he would tell them <coughs> what needed to be done to, to make their beekeeping better. And that not all of them took much notice. But uh, that's where the, all the information came from, which was the basis of uh, Chain Bridge Honey Farm. Because I was a single child and we were living out in the country. And I spent my holidays, a lot of my holidays, going around with my father. So I'm bound to, lose, to listen to all the, what was going on, all these old worthies, and what they were saying about the bees. And some of them, I think, they talked about very little less than beekeeping, you know. But my mother thought it was fine, she didn't mind. You know. But certainly Smith was devoted to, to, he had 120 hives as the first commercial beekeeper in Scotland, in Peebles, which was a very difficult place to keep bees because it was cold. Uh, but the hills there were, were, were um, covered in bell heather and then the, there was the ling heather after that. So that was the basis of his business. That's what he... And nothing, there would be no honey gathered until July. They didn't build up the bees. He had some colossal strong colonies, but they didn't start producing honey till <coughs> July. That's how late it was. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of those places now are covered in forestry. There was a big push on forestry, and uh, that was the end of that. <coughs> it wasn't a good area for beekeeping after that. We had three trucks built uh, by a chap in, uh, in Yorkshire on a Land Rover uh, engines and gearboxes, but he made the chassis and everything. So we've got three of them, and they, they're, 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 I've got, we've got trucks that'll last for a very long time, 30, 40, 50 years. Uh, aluminium, alumin, aluminium bodies and galvanised chassis. And the idea here is to find uh, walls to put the bees against, to try and get some, some gain <coughs> in the colder weather, keep the wind off them and that. Because north of Thumberland is a pretty difficult place to keep bees. It's very close to the North Sea and the northwest wind comes down from Greenland and across past Norway and right down into East Lothian and, and badly into our area. But that's just tradition. We are Northumberland beekeepers, but it's a, it's a difficult place to keep bees. I keep black bees, which uh, we've always had them and uh, never been really tempted to, to change to any other bees uh, because they've always kept us. And we were pleased just recently some people did some some uh, in Edinburgh did some analysis on our bees and found that there were between 90 and 94 percent Hapis mellifera. So we can't understand how that happened because uh, the bees have, have got them, themselves there on their own. You know, there haven't been any any line breeding or anything like that done with them. They've just so they've, they've actually. There have been an awful lot of imports into Northumberland. Not as many imports in Northumberland as there have been at other places. Uh, and the imports generally fade away. And uh, New Zealand and this sort of thing uh, fade away. And the black bees come through stronger. So it lets you see that uh, they, 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 contr they control their own destiny if they aren't flooded with imports. You know. But we keep them because we like them. And, uh, they're not nasty, we don't have any problem with, with, the, with them attacking us. At the early stages in the, in, the, in, the, in the sort of 60s and 70s, we were going through the hives every nine days. Some of you, some of you will be familiar with that, the nine day inspection. Uh, that made them upset and they were actually looking for us when we came. 
And my father said, well, we'll have to stop that, you know. And, and we did stop it. And uh, leave them alone as much as possible. Never upset them, you know. We're not industrial beekeepers. Uh, for all, we keep huge numbers of colonies. We don't, we don't uh, treat them. We treat them the same as if we had two, you know. And that, that pays dividends because they're quite pleased to see us now. They're not bothered. There's only about one, maybe three highs out of a hundred that'll, that'll show themselves to be aggressive. In a year or two, they'll have changed their queen a time or two and then they've got, they've got out of it, you know, out of the aggression. So the, the main body of the bees are, aren't aggre ag aggressive at all. You'd have to be pretty clumsy to upset them, you know. But, uh, so with black bees, that's an important thing, is treat them with great respect and they'll come round to your way of thinking. But uh, more recently, well, I might as well start at the beginning because as I said, when, we're, when we were going around with pa my father, he said that, uh, that uh, well, my mother said, y your father wants a honey farm. And he had come from very humble beginnings. And uh, so that's what we started on in 1963, which was 60 years. <laughs> that's when I started work. And, uh, making hives and one thing or another and working away. And of course, the, uh, the, main, the main income in those days was clover honey because agriculture was entirely dependent on clover and it was over the whole country, Norfolk, Devon, everywhere. Agriculture was dependent on what we call indigenous clover, which doesn't exist now, I don't think. But uh, bees were able to get a decent amount of honey in June and uh, even if they were pretty poor bees, they still got a lot of honey. Uh, and there was a lot of grassland, a lot of rotations, and uh, it all worked very well. Even in the 60s, we still had some clover before a lot of corn growing and agriculture became intensive. And that sort of made things difficult. But we still carted the bees away up into the hills where farmers wouldn't use any fertilizer. And it's interesting, I've just heard the other day some farmers saying they're never going to use any more fertilizer on the grass, you know. But of course the fertilizer, the nitrogenous fertilizer killed the clover. And uh, the spray from the thistles killed the clover as well. So that was an end of an era for us, you know. And things weren't, uh, weren't so easy then. In 1971 the oilseed rape came on the go and that, that was a sort of European crop. And, and farmers uh, seized on that because it was a break from the corn and the honey was pretty awful. Uh, smelt the cabbages and, and crystallised like a rock. And even then there were so many beekeepers producing sections and they, they, uh, they, uh, they couldn't sell that. The, so they packed up. They, just, they weren't going to change from sections so they just packed up. But half the beekeepers packed up because of the oilseed rape. But of course, we needed to make a living, you know. And we had a, a lot of honey, but we had a great deal of difficulty with it because it crystallised in the hives and, and we messed about no end uh, trying to deal with it. And mostly by overheating it, which spoilt the honey. It's worth noting that if honey gets heat, any honey, even your heat honey, which most of the beekeepers here won't heat the honey, and that's what makes it, that what makes it worth money, you know. But as soon as you start to heat the honey, it, uh, it spoils it. It has a dead taste. It's lost, it's lost something. And uh, we had to heat the oilseed rape honey and all. We had a difficult time. A lot of, yeah. and, and we've got that sorted out now as well. Everything sort of has to take time and sort it out. But uh, more recently, uh, the rapes cease to yield honey. Uh, the hybrids of... of uh, have been introduced that don't yield honey. You can understand that because they'll be wanting, the plant breeders will be wanting oil to be reduced, uh, not so much nectar, you know. So actually hardly bother to take bees to the rape now. We'll just leave them in the winter sites. And if they get some honey, well and good. But at least uh, if you take them out of the winter sites when the rape's out, which is in April, um, you, you, you start to do them a lot of damage uh, because of the cold. And uh, last year, our beekeeping didn't start till the 12th of June because it was so the northerly winds. 
It was so persistent and we didn't take the, put the bees out of the winter sites. So that, that has a big effect as well on, on, our, on our work because we can't get started, you know. And it, I should say that I went to the lecture last night and of course a lot of you here will be wanting to know how we're coping with the... Well, the Barua was a bad setback for us and we did, we did a bit of treating but over the years we've sort of run down the treating to fairly a fairly low level, not bothering too much, and trying to get the bees resistant to it. And that's sort of happened, you know. We very rarely see any varroa in the hives, you know. If we do see varroa, then we, we treat them, obviously. But a lot of the hives have no varroa in them that you can actually detect. But what we have found is that uh, uh, there's a great upsurge in queenlessness uh, over the last 10 years or so. And uh, uh, we haven't really got to the bottom of that, you know, but we've had to see about what we're going to do about it. And uh, talking about the 12th of June, of course, to, to do something about queenlessness, we have to <coughs> make nuclei, a lot of nuclei, you know, hundreds, hundreds and hundreds of nuclei. But because the weather's bad, we can't do it. The bees won't, you kind of go into the hives of bees to make nuclei. But uh, this year we've managed, even at that time, starting on the 12th of June, all the nuclei have been quite successful uh, because the, um, when it gets into July, the, the drones, there are more drones about and there are more drones that are able to mate with the queens, which is, uh, which is uh, critical, you know. We find that the later the nuclei are mated, uh, the better they go, you know. Anybody that keeps a few hives here and there they prepare to have another apiary somewhere else and have the nuclei in the apiary away from the, the main lot, you know. Because this queen, queenless problem is, uh, whatever is causing it, it's contagious. So you could get a whole lot of bees, hives in one apiary going down with it. And it's better to have, well, we are lucky because we've got apiaries all over the place. And we'll have, if we have a disaster somewhere, uh, we'll each, we've got bees somewhere else that are all right, you know. So whatever it is, is contagious. And then there's another, another problem where the hives are collapsing. You'll have come across that most of you. Hive, just great big strong hive just collapsing. And uh, that's a bit of a bad go as well. Well, they're just a write-off. You know, you just have to wait another year until they get themselves pulled together again. And most of them, it doesn't kill any of them, but they just collapse, you know. Very common. So that's the two things that are bothering us at the present. Uh, Queenlessness, and you know, when I was when I was a kid, when we was young, some of the queens, my father used to say, "Well, that queen's four years old, and it's still got some some good in it, you know. It don't kill it, you know. Uh, put it into your nucleus somewhere, and it's it, now you'd be lucky to get a queen to go one year, you know, and certainly difficult to get it through two years, you know. So there's something gone drastically wrong in the hives, you know. Reproduction's been badly affected, you know." <coughs> queens, well, some big colonies we've discovered as many times, colonies with, with three supers of honey on, and uh, they've just collapsed and the wasps have rubbed them out. Well, what's happened is that the queen, you know, well, I've written it, uh, I've written it all down, but it, the, the black bees at a certain time of year put the queen off the lay uh, in order to build up colony numbers to get a crop of honey. And often when that happens, the queen doesn't come back onto the lay. And, but the, the bees are, are saying, well, we've got a queen, and okay in that. But eventually they should be superseding her straight away, and they're not superseding her, and then they find themselves with no eggs to make any supersede your cells, you know. So you get a colossal hive. You know, you could say, oh, well, is malnutrition the trouble? Well, it's not the trouble if they've got three supers of honey on, you know. Uh, it's something we don't understand, but we went to lecture last night and I don't think really anybody understands what, what's really happening. But it's, it's probably, well, it's as bad as Barua. It's just a bad, bad go, you know. Uh, but this last year, we haven't, we've got a lot of honey and we haven't been so badly affected. So if the bees, obviously the bees, the bees this last year, after they got going, uh, they appreciated the decent weather. So that, that tells you that something, whatever's going wrong in the hives, some of it's to do with mo low morale, that bad weather <laughs> doesn't help them, you know. 
And uh, we, 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 where we are, there's a lot of bad weather, you know. But this year it got, it got hot and stayed hot. And um, we haven't so many empty hives, you know. Empty hives are a big feature, a feature in this last Baroa age, you know. Empty hives all over the place. But you've got to have, well, the view I took was that if you had Baroa in the hives, they would learn to be resistant to it. But if you kept wiping them out, they would never learn to be resistant to them, you know. Now, I remember in the 1950s that uh, Nazima and Akarin were big diseases, and you'll have heard of Nazima. And, uh, and my father said, well, you've just got to let them die. The ones that weren't resistant uh, won't put up with the Nazima. Just let them die, you know. And we came through that, and we came through, we went 40 odd years with colonies that really weren't bothered with any kind of disease because they'd got themselves resistant to it, you know. It's all very sort of, uh, well, it's interesting, but they, they can look after themselves to, uh, the bees can to a fair degree. Look at black bees especially. Yeah, shelter. Probably too close together. I've got them put down in ivy, you notice? Ivy's a great plant to put bees down in, it's bone dry. That's the candy and some other candy that we were feeding them, which was a waste of time. We feed them all with candy, fondant. We never use any syrup. Used to use syrup and fed up with it. Great big wall, you know, to keep them, keep them. Uh, and you see those highs, we've, we've got some of that roofing sheet underneath them. We've cut up roofing sheets that are redundant. And they are insulated and dry. Keep them right out of the wet, you know. Michael, my queen rare. <laughs> well, Michael Collier here. Uh, uh, we got into some sort of partnership with us to, oh, that's the, uh, to rear black bees, which is, I'm really pleased about that, you know, because we've got a scheme going now where we're going to try and, and we just select them by looking at them, you know, we never, we never bother much with, we just say, well, provided they haven't got um, chalk brood, you know, and select them and look at them and, uh, and just use that as a colony. We make no attempt to, see how much honey they get or anything like that. We're just, a te you know, black bees and work on with them that way. And he's doing the queen rearing. And uh, sooner or later we'll start and do a bit of queen rearing ourselves, but it's so cold, you know, but he, he can, he's in Shropshire, so he can do quite a bit of queen rearing. And the time will come when Michael will be rearing a lot of black bees, or oh, black bees, queens, a lot. And there are people in the country that want them. There are plenty of people in the country that don't want them. <laughs> but there are people in the country that want them. And uh, they're good bees, you know. But remember when we started that, that uh, Dad, Dad was buying, buying bees from people he knew and there were bees left to us, a hundred hives were left to the Chainbridge honey farm uh, by people. But uh, we often got feral colonies. And there's a big distinction, again, referring back to the lecture last night, there's a big distinction between feral colonies and, and black bees, like commercial black bees. There's a big distinction. And I, I've yet to work out how that works as well, but they're talking about the genetics and the allelies and this sort of thing. But everybody, that Willie Smith in particular, he would start with feral colonies and he would end up with, with colonies that would fill three, three brood chambers with brood and started with black, colon, black uh, feral, which would only fill about five frames with brood. So how that worked, I don't know. I don't, he didn't do any selection, although he must have done some selection. I think all the beekeepers must have done a bit of selection. But you, a black bee has to be a, a commercial uh, bee, you know, to be of any use. The black bees are really of no use to beekeepers. The only way there are any use to beekeepers was, or is, that. There were, black, there were feral colonies that were resistant to varroa from day one in many places, you know. Not common, but there would be more than what you knew because you don't know where the feral colonies are. But in Ireland as well, there were feral colonies that had never taken varroa. And that was one gene that they had which, which was beneficial. You know? not a lot of people realise that. You know? But our, our black bees were more commercial more adventurous, uh, bigger brood nests, harder workers, all the rest. They had everything going for them. So we eventually had to get, 
get to a stage where we didn't have any federal colonies. Well, we never eliminated them. My father says, just keep them, keep them going over 10 or 15 years and they'll eventually come right because they'll get into the same systems as the good ones, you know, work their way out of it, you know. So obviously bees can improve themselves genetically without humans bothering with them, you know. It's all to do with the, the beekeeper and how the beekeeper looks after them and put them in good places and make sure they're not starving and one thing or another and just a, a, well, a beekeeper. A beekeeper is a good part of it anyway, of that, that way of bees becoming good bees, you know, useful bees. And this year we've seen that because we've had a few <coughs> middling years and that this year they're, they're all chock full, they can't believe it, you know. The, the lads that work with us, they can't believe it. And it's, it's, it's helped them as well, the people that work for us because they are badly affected by things going wrong with the bees and can't put up with it. And, uh, but this year's, you know, and let you see the bees are fine, there's nothing the matter with them, except queenlessness and, uh, and a general uh, sort of colony collapse, which is, I don't know, I don't know what it is. But I phoned a bloke in, uh, in St Andrews University and he was a virologist and he knew all about it. That was his job, you know, he was a beekeeper and a virologist. Evans, I think his name was. And he said, well, if you've got any varroa in your hive, uh, you'll have trouble with queenlessness and, 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 and viruses. Well, you'll have trouble with viruses, you know. And, and then the next thing, of course, was that, well, we need the varroa in our hives for the bees to become resistant to it. You know? So you're going, you know. My friends in Denmark, they, they were, treating the hives three times a year to try and get rid of varroa, you know, so they were never going to get rid of it, you know. Uh, they, uh, and we, we hear that on the continent, that the varroa is getting more powerful, but at least with us it's getting very, very weak, extremely weak. Ninety percent of the varroa is gone, you know. So we've, get, we've got that sort of right, you know, but we can't do anything about the viruses because we don't understand. But I suppose that the bees will have to get over the viruses and just whatever, you know. But it, the trouble is it takes one season, another season, it might take 20 seasons for them to get over the virus, you know, until they're, until they're in good shape again. And, and the, you know, bees go over millions of years, but humans don't, you know. So it has to go from generation to generation, you know. Uh, that's it. The hives are up on, up off the wet, out of the ground, you know. A little and all our hives are moved uh, manually. So it's like a little pallet. And then at this time of year, they've got the entrances reduced right down. So they're just, they're just coming out of one corner to keep the wind out because the wind in the winter is punishing. You see it there, you see it after the break. We've got great big deep roofs, 10 inch roofs. Keep the wind off the top, keep the rain off. And they oh, are super high, very cheap, very cheap to make as well, you know. I buy Thuya, um, which is a western red cedar, but it's grown in England. And dry it and make it. Most of the hives have been made in Thuya. Some have been made in western red cedar. And we've made most of the hives. I see that brood box we haven't made. That's been bought in. But most of the hives we've made ourselves. We've got a big woodworking shop. And we have the knowledge to do fairly simple work, you know. Buy the trees, get them cut up, dry the wood, plane them into simple sizes to make smith hives. And uh, probably the natural hive, you can lift, lift it easily. Smith hives, the handholds aren't much use, which is not easy, the handholds. But the natural hive has decent handholds. So that's, that's a bonus with the nationals. But uh, small brood nests, because uh, in a bad year, you can often get a decent amount of honey off a small brood nest, uh, because they don't have so much brood to feed. And as I mentioned, there are every black bee, every colony of black bees put, put, puts their queen off the lay in July, early July, most of them do, so that they don't have a lot of brood to look after. If there's a honey flow comes on in July, some of them will have no brood to look after. And that means the, the workforce is doubled, you know. So that's their way of, of having a small brood nest and having a huge workforce uh, when it's important in the latter half of the summer. Yeah. So.
So it's interesting that people buy in buckfast bees to have huge brood nests, but sometimes where we are, huge brood nests aren't necessarily a good idea. You know? Oh, there's an old bus side. We run round a map for charity. We used to hire it out, but we don't bother now. It's all part of the visitor centre. We, we built up a huge visitor centre because, well, really out of enthusiasm and uh, education, because there's a, we've got a huge amount of beekeeping information on the on the walls. Uh, very, very, you know, so the public can come in and understand beekeeping if they read long if they read long enough. And then we sell our own products, so. We have four, five hundred shops that we trade into, uh, but then we have our own retail place at home, so we get the retail price there, and that was what offsets the amount of money that the shops owe us, because uh, there was a time when we, we had difficulty in getting money out the shops, because uh, the supermarkets wrecked the shops, the supermarkets put such pressure on the little shops, most of them disappeared and they were my customers. And, uh, and then the ones that didn't disappear couldn't pay me because they weren't making any money. So they, you know, I sold sell a lot of honey uh, at the retail price at home and promote the business and one thing or another, you know. So a multifaceted business, you know. Many different things going on at the same time. Uh, the delivery van. I don't, we don't do so much delivery now because it's, it's, it's more costly than sending the parcels by post. Just to give you an idea of the place itself. Gives you some idea of the size of the place. We're always doing a bit more every year. We've put a lot, since the lockdown, we've put an awful lot of effort into gardens. And uh, we thought that people like, when they come about, they like to see a garden, and we'll do that. So we're still at that in a big way, putting gardens in. We've supported an awful lot of craft people at our place, and all, a lot, at least a dozen. So that chap's been painting for 25 years. Every, every surface in the places he's painted, beautiful work. So it all adds to the attraction, and it all makes it so that people want to buy your honey rather than supermarket honey, because the, the pressure from the supermarkets are more than ever, greater than ever, Supermarkets coming in where they must be losing money, so many of them, and yet our, our little business goes on apace. I have no fear of them, you know. They've never, we've got the better of them, and that's it, you know. They won't, they won't affect us ever again, because we've got such, so much loyalty from the public. Uh, to come to the place for free, without no charge, and have a look around and, and buy some products, you know. But, uh, I mean, running a beekeeper business, well, Lately, of course, there's been a, there, are, there have been people uh, bottling a lot of honey and some of the big honey producers in Yorkshire and that have been able to get honey away because the, the general public are looking for better quality honey, you know, and, and the market has increased greatly, you know. So there is a, there is a, a you know, a demand for British honey, uh, which wasn't there 30 years ago. I mean, the price of British honey 30 years ago was down as low as 30 pence a pound, and now it's three, pound, it's three quid now, three pound a pound. And it's like staying, it doesn't seem to be going to drop. It's, it's, uh, the supermarkets would like to see it drop, but it hasn't dropped so far, you know. But we are out of that. Uh, we don't have anything to do with anybody. We control our own markets totally, which because we keep black bees in a difficult area is important, because if we don't get very much honey, we can sell it at a decent price. We produced an awful lot of wax, and, uh, heather wax. Uh, the rape honey, when we were working on with it, we cut the frames out, and we didn't bother with, with trying to extract them or any of that nonsense. We just cut the frames out. Uh, so we had a lot of wax. And then the, the heather honey went through a hydro extractor, so there was a lot of wax there, beautiful quality wax, as you see. And then my mother said, well, how about have a go at some cosmetics? That was 30 years ago. So we've been making cosmetics for 30 years as an addition to the honey. Very hand creams and lip, lip balms and that sort of thing. But the wax at the present time is, is uh, again, it's, 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 there's not enough wax in the country to keep the supply going. 
and you'll notice there's a lot of Chinese wax been coming in, and that's that's grim, grim stuff. You know, a lot of substitution in the wax trade, and ten pound a pound. That's the wholesale value of wax at ten pound a pound. So the more wax you can produce, the better, and that 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 applies to everybody. Good quality wax. The rape honey. It's a long story, but uh, we smash it all up and one thing and another and that. And we put it through a very sophisticated uh, centrifuge, which manages to take the crystals out of the wax. And then we put the honey through a homogenizer, which came out of a dairy got many, many years ago. And uh, it smashes the crystals up, the homogenizer. And then we've got a product that we can sell. And that's a, a standard product which everybody buys. You know, that's Robson's Honey is that product, and it stays the same all the time because it goes through the same systems all the time. You know. So we do very little extracting. We extract a bit of heather honey, but very little. Most of the heather honey goes for cut comb. And uh, we've tried, that's another thing that's helped our business, that we were always selling cut comb for, for quite a lot of money. And uh, were the only ones in the country that were producing cut comb, uh, which fitted with, with black bees and one thing or another. And, well, the cut comb just now, it's worth, I don't know how much, but I think it's probably worth £10 a pound wholesale, same as beeswax. Uh, and a ready market for it, people desperate to buy it, you know. So you can see the business is very integrated, you know, always. You know. But the business centre is huge. I keep adding to it. Somebody's brought in a hundred pictures from the wildlife, local wildlife. And I'm doing a big, big thing about uh, people locally that uh, did very well in the war. So that's another feature. People, families being able to come and see the, the, the people, what they did in the war, you know, which, which is really interesting. You know. All the bravery and the efforts made by local people. One of them with a BC and another with three MCs. And, oh, it's all forgotten about. If you don't put it up on the wall, it's all forgotten about. You, know. you can see um, we employ a lot of people. I couldn't say how many, but the, you can see the amount of work that's put in by the, by the work people, people that work in our place. Got some very, very good employees. Very diligent. Look after everything. If it belongs to Willie Robson, they look after it. Because I don't shout at them. <laughs> Loyal people, yeah. We've got better packaging for the cut comb. But we haven't really worked that out yet either. How to pack the cut comb. That's the Smith, Smith Hive in pieces. Belonged to Robert Couston. I don't know if you, some of you remember him. Great lad, Couston teaching beekeeping. When he started the, that business centre, a lady came in and asked if she had been doing voluntary work. Uh, she does have two children to support. Have you got any work? I said, well, what work? You know, what do you do? Well, I'm a calligrapher. And she was Dutch. And she, the, she, she, wrote, she wrote it up, the whole, the whole, all the information on the walls, which run way over a hundred pictures. She wrote it all up and framed it. And handwritten. And people, it's so well written, you could, you'd think a computer had done it, but that, that, was, that came from the times when all the schools had bees, and that was a model beehive in a school across in the, the borders. And it was being used as a blanket box. All the, high, all the schools had bees at one time. We've got two honey houses. We had, we had built one and then, <coughs> subdivided it a bit and then built another. All the building we've done ourselves on, this, on, the, on the place with the people that work for us. They just, in the winter time, work, just start on a building and put some of it up and next year put some more up. And that way you can paper it, paper it as we go. Cut, we shift the high honey about in those great big tubs. They hold 1,600 weight of honey. So is there any, any more, that you, anything that you'd like to pick on? You talk about your colonies. Um, how do you do your swarm control? And what proportion of your colonies are um, supersede your sort of colonies and 
prolific swarmers. When we first started, and we're up to when we had about 600 colonies, we were doing the nine-day inspection and making artificial swarms. Uh, and then that got too much and the bees were getting nasty. Uh, and then after that, we tipped the hives on my back and had a look up underneath and made a nucleus if they were going to swarm. So that lasted another three or four hundred hives. But at least we didn't have to pull the frames out, you know, because we were having to go on a wet day and pull frames out and, and the bees weren't going to have it. So by tipping the hives back, which any bee could do, and have a look and see if any queen cells. If there's an egg, it'll be all right. But if there's jelly, you've got to do something. Yeah, you'll know all about that, jelly. And, and tip the hive on its back, you know, and, and lift the supers off before you tip it on. And then actually, if you look down through the queen extruder, if it's a wire one, you'll see the cells all along the top bars. And if you'll see any cells that are extended. If you look squint, you'll see tails that are extended on the top bars. That generally get, get yourself round, you know. But when the rape got going, we never, we started to get, we couldn't cope because we, if we went trying to do swarm control, we couldn't, uh, we couldn't uh, get the supers on quick enough. We had to put crates on quick, you know, and then we messed about with swarm control. And the other thing is when we were, when we were doing swarm control, there was, there was unripe honey all over the place, dripping. And it's shambles, you know. So after that, we, we never bothered very much with the swarm control until after the rape was finished. And just making nuclei, make a nucleus up and shift the, pot, the, the parent colony away to another place, two or three yards away. And that generally was, up, was fine, you know. It's all you needed to do and it's all you had time to do, you know. More lately, we've been very little bothered with swarming. I would rather that the swarm more. But that's all to do with this queenless to carry on. This, the, the viruses have, have upset the reproduction, upset them, you know. And I look at hives and I say to myself, I don't know what, I don't think these bees know what they're doing. And they don't. Their instincts have been badly affected with viruses, you know. And uh, I see that all the time. I say, well, what's this hive thinking they're going to do, you know? And they don't know what they're going to do because they're in, under a lot of pressure. Bees are under a lot of pressure, you know. And you can see that because people say, oh, well, we'll get over the losses in that. But how many losses? There's losses every year, you know. And then it's not just us. I hear all around Scotland, huge losses, you know. And people sort of say, well, they don't like to talk about it and we'll get over it and that, you know. But it was never like that before. Although, to be fair, there were some winters in Scotland where there were 100% wipeouts, you know, 100%, you know. Some of the bee farmers up the East Coast lost every hive that they had, you know. But that would be more to do with bad winter sites and Nozema, you know. But Nozema seems to have largely disappeared, you know. You never, and you never hear anything about Akarin. I never knew anything about Akarin anyway, you know. But uh, we don't bother much with the swarming now. Just after, well, we do, you know, we do. We have a look, you know. You know. I've got a lad who works for us and he's, he's, he's really keen to look. They make, a, they make a nucleus up and they move the hive away. That's what they do. But it's all spoilt with this problem with queenlessness and these viruses, you know. Mm. But we don't lose much with swarming. You, you come across a great row of hives and none of them are swarmed, you know. Not good, eh? I'd rather see them swarming. Willie, with, with the um, queenlessness going on, or, or queens which stop laying, uh -huh. I, I refer to it as egg bound because I've always found those queens have a very big abdomen on them. Have you found the same? Well, that, that's an observation I haven't made of you. No, but it could be, you know. But there's something wrong with the queens, you know. But I'm saying, what I say was that in, 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 in real terms, the black bees always put the queen off the lay in, in the late June and July. Most of them did so that there were no brood to feed. And if there was no brood to feed, then, the, then they could get a decent crop of honey. You know, they can't be either getting honey or feeding brood. It's not, you know, it's too much, especially in a bad, bad. So some of those queens fail to come back onto the lay. Something goes wrong. And, and, and then the colony's lost because by the time the bees have realized that, the, there's, that there's a problem, there's no eggs in the hives, so they can't supersede, you know. And that's been a big loss to us, because if you get a colony with a hundred pound of honey on, robbed out, 
It's a lot of money. It's 500 quid, you know. But I've been on that long. That I'm used to knockbacks, you know. Just have to top it out. Is, is there any money in commercial beekeeping? <laughs> any? Money in commercial beekeeping. Money? <laughs> well, I, I, we've, gone, we've gone all those times, you know. Yeah. We've, gone, we've gone, you know, even now, even in the bad times, the business is sufficiently powerful to, to make us pay income tax. We've never stopped paying income tax. Even in the very worst, we still had to pay quite a lot of income tax. And it pay, the, the business pays, at the present time, 15,000 a month in wages. Wow. And sometimes, in years gone by, much more than that, too much more, you know. And, and what's the worst thing that's happened during your beekeeping career? Um, probably the Barua. There was a spell between 1985 and uh, 1988 where the sun never came out. Uh, if you were a farmer, you'd remember that. And we went, oh, we just, just struggled by, but we, the bees stayed alive. And the funny thing was, in 88, they all had queens, so they had all superseded. In, in, a, in what you would say was impossible weather, you know? And this was referred to last night about the black bees, well, the black bees coming out at the heather and getting mated beside the hives, which is one of the reasons, as Michael says, that the black bees, our black bees, have become so pure because they're capable of getting mated at a much lower temperature. Uh, than imported colonies, which he would, you know. And they wouldn't necessarily become inbred either because there's obviously at the head of this, you know, there's 10 or 20 hives, you know. But they're getting mated at a very much lower temperature. And uh, 63 were lost just about all the hives. There was four put of snow for 12 weeks, which was a bad set. I couldn't believe it. Every hive I looked in was dead. But uh, we had friends that helped us, you know. My father had a lot of friends, well he did, he had a lot of friends. Got a few hives here, a few hives there. And then at, in about 1970 or something, I went on my own. Dad wouldn't, he wasn't going to have any more to do with the money. But we've always made, always made a profit, one way or another. Just kept it going, just keep on with doing what you do, you know, and get through. And the thing was that the, the black bees, of, 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 uh, well, we just like them, like to have them, and that's about it, you know. And they're not nasty, so we don't have a problem. And uh, they've always kept us, you know. But I suppose the Barua is probably the worst thing that's happened. That been, you know, that lockdown wasn't much fun either, you know. But that was, wasn't to do with the bees, you know. Do you think um, there's a possibility that pesticides may have something to do with yeah. it? Mm. Yeah. Is that a problem? Well, well in my lifetime, we went mm. from the 50s, the 1950s, to no organic, organic agriculture. Ag 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 agriculture was organic in the 50s, you know. And in that, since then, the, the land around us has been poisoned. And in a, big, in a big part of the country, the land has been colossally poisoned by... Well, not farmers, but farmers take the blame, you know. But the chemical companies, and still going on yet, but there have been some seriously dangerous chemicals used on the land uh, with, with government approval, you know. And, and now I see the land out and around us has been, it's, it's, only a, it's only a medium for chemicals. There is no fertility in the land, whatever. And the treat basins are very, a very fertile area, but it isn't because it, oh, nothing grows unless it gets chemical, large amounts of chemical. Well, that must have an effect on the bees because it goes into the hives, you know, same as it goes into our bodies, you know. But the, the government's been very lax in allowing the chemical companies to, to spread so much poison, you know. And then, of course, organophosphorus is one of them and oh, a whole lot of others. The fruit trees, the fruit industry was absolutely... I mean, they wouldn't take bees at the finish to the fruit. The beekeepers wouldn't go because there was that much chemical. And worse in America. So you must understand that we are now subjected to huge amounts of chemical, just in the food industry, never mind any other types of pollution. And that all goes into beehives. 
So it didn't help, you know. But I can't say, but I pretty well know, you know, that that sort of pollution, it wasn't there when I was a child, you know. But it is now. And then they say now, well, they're never out, the fields with sprayers now. They're never out. They're never finished. They say the chemicals are all right, but they said that before. Always the chemicals are all right. You'll be all right. It'll be fine. But it's not fine, you know. It's a massive problem, you know. But they say if it went back to organic, it couldn't feed the world, you know. But into beehive, it'd be all in beehives, same as it in our bodies, you know. Just a quick one um, about equipment. Do you run on solid floors because it's so cold? Yeah. Because mm -hmm. yeah. I try to keep the draft out, you know. I try to keep the wind out of the floors, you know. Because we're just a single box, you know. And then I've got, uh, I've got, you know, they've got to have brood in the middle frames, you know. They've got to be, they've actually got to be replacing the bees uh, in, in, in January, you know, because we, we have a seven month winter. So the bees have to be pretty sharp on replacing the bees, you know. They're not going to last seven months. So come January, they've got to be a little bit of brood, you know, which means pushing some, pushing some wood into the front and, uh, and keeping the draft out, you know. I can't have, have floors that are wire mesh and that because uh, they'll, never get the, they'll never get any bees ready for April, you know. And even in April, this last year, they had to go from April to the middle of June before they got on their feet. So you have a long, long, long brood rearing period, you know. So you've got to keep them sort of semi-warm, you know.